This sermon is brought to you by Bloomfield Presbyterian Church, Belfast. To know Jesus and share his love. So this evening we're back into the book of Philippians, um, following on our series over these Sunday evenings. So if you want to turn with me um, in your Bible, a pew Bible on your device, to Philippians chapter 3. And we're going to start in verse 7 and read through to the end of the chapter. So Philippians chapter 3, beginning at verse 7. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenwards in Christ Jesus. All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. And if at some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring together everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Amen. We're going to take some time now um, to pray for others. And as we do that, um, we'll be thinking about various situations around the world. So let's bow our heads and pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a big God and that in the words of the song we learnt as children, you have the whole world in your hands. And Father, as lay people, we don't really fully understand the full implications and outcomes of the decisions made at the COP26 conference. But we do know that our brothers and sisters around the world suffer because of the effects of a changing climate. In our efforts to alleviate that suffering, help us not to introduce new initiatives and ideas which could have the unintended consequence of exacerbating difficulties that already exist or exploit people in different ways or create more problems which generations to come will have to tackle. There's so much in the world that we don't understand and one of those is the escalating crisis between Belarus and Poland. Father, you know that there's great potential for instability that could spill over into other nations. And we ask for an easing of political tensions and a way forward that would mean preservation of life and a reduction in threat levels. Lord, and we want to pray for our government and particularly in light of allegations about elected representatives at Westminster who've abused their privileged positions and in ways which undermine our trust and expectations of those in power. And we pray for those with responsibility to uphold standards, that they would be able to get to the truth of matters in a way which is fair and transparent. We pray for our local elected representatives who serve at Westminster, 
that you would keep them safe as they travel to and from London on a regular basis. And we ask that you would give them wisdom in each of the decisions that they make and for each of the situations presented by their constituents, many of whom find themselves in great need. We want to give you thanks for the work of Storehouse and the new way that they plan to distribute food to those who require their support. Thank you for the shop that will allow their clients to choose their own food and supplies according to their own tastes and needs. And we pray that those who use this service will find this to be a really easy way to access support and that those who serve them will continue to be filled with compassion and opportunities to share your good news. Finally, Father, we bring to you our own church family with its particular needs and concerns. We pray for healing for those dealing with COVID, comfort for those who are struggling physically, mentally or emotionally, peace for our primary sevens and other young people facing exams, and strength and renewed energy for our ministry team. Thank you that you hear and answer our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, I've not been um, in this pulpit for a while. I haven't been to a Sunday evening service for a while, so it's really lovely to be here tonight and to be able to look around and see such a wonderful mixture of old and young worshipping God together tonight. Um, I've been preaching in various different places the last while, but it's great to be able to come back to... I've offended Graham. <laughs> You're in the younger category, Graham. Is that the... Is that the yeah. <laughs> Um, I was going to say it feels great to come back to home base, but perhaps it's not, because you know, there's no respect or anything. Um, great, the last words of that song, weren't they? Um, soon our faith will turn to sight, uh, we'll have fruition, um, and pray, prayer will turn to praise. But that's not where we are yet. We're still in the point where we live by faith, aren't we? And so we still need to pray. So why don't I lead us in a brief prayer as we turn to God's word uh, tonight. Let's pray. Uh, our Father in heaven, uh, we ask that this evening your word would be our rule, your spirit our teacher, and your glory our supreme concern. And we pray that in Jesus, our Saviour's name. Amen. Well, if you can turn to Philippians 3 uh, and have that open, that would be fantastic. Uh, the last thing Emma and I did last Sunday evening was we were able to tune in to the service that was being streamed from Kirkpatrick Memorial uh, earlier on that evening, where they were having a prospective new minister uh, speaking to them and being interviewed by them, uh, Graham Kennedy, and he's been selected, and he'll be serving in Kirkpatrick uh, starting soon. Um, but Graham was asked, what is your favourite book of the Bible? And the answer that he gave was Philippians. He said, this is a book that's been with me ever since I first became a Christian all the way through. And interestingly, I thought, he described this little letter to the Philippians as a kind of a manual for discipleship. A manual for discipleship. And I thought that was quite interesting, because I suppose on the surface, the letter to the Philippians, as we know by now, it is not obviously a manual for discipleship. It's most obviously a thank you letter, isn't it? Uh, the Apostle Paul is in prison, and the Philippians have sent the Apostle some money, a financial gift to help him while he's in prison. And so the Apostle Paul is picking up his pen and writing a thank you letter to the Philippians. But of course, there's lots more going on than that, isn't there? Uh, the Apostle Paul also talks about how the Philippian church and himself are experiencing persecution. Uh, he talks about internal disagreements uh, that are happening in the church, and we'll be looking at that a little bit more next week. And he also talks in this chapter about the danger that comes from false teaching. And I suppose the Apostle's consistent theme all the way through, as we've been hearing, is to rejoice in the Lord. That's the way to deal with all of these different problems and challenges that face us. Rejoice in the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who humbled himself for us and is now exalted at God's right hand. And I suppose if this is a letter that's a kind of a manual for discipleship, then at the very heart of what the Apostle Paul thinks discipleship is all about, it's rejoicing in the Lord. That's like the key, I guess, to being a Christian disciple. But in this uh, chapter that we're looking at this evening, chapter 3, what Paul is engaging with, I think, is a kind of an alternative model for discipleship. 
Uh, an alternative way of growing as a Christian. You can kind of see a hint of that in verse 15. Uh, Paul says, all of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. And that little word mature seems to have been a kind of a buzzword that some of the Philippian false teachers, uh, or the false teachers anyway that the Philippians might have heard, were, were offering. They were talking about how you can be mature as a Christian, or you could translate that as being perfect. In some way, the Philippian, these false teachers were saying to the Philippians, if you want to be mature, if you want to be a kind of a complete Christian, then you're going to need to be fully Jewish. You're going to need to keep the ceremonial law. And the, the emblem of that was circumcision. You see that in verse 2. Paul says, watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh, for it is we who are the true circumcision. Now, Paul's basic response to that, his basic position we, we heard last time, uh, comes in verse 9. Uh, or verse 8, we could say, um, Paul says, look, whenever I look at all this stuff, all of these different kind of human ways of, of, uh, of being mature, human ways of being complete, Paul says, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from, from God on the basis of faith. So that's the sort of the basic position that, that Paul takes in response to this false teaching. He says, look, we are saved and justified, made righteous by God simply on the basis of receiving Christ by faith. That is how we get to be perfect and complete and mature and whole as God's people. Okay, not a righteousness of my own, not what I do through keeping the law or anything like that, but the righteousness that is, that is mine by faith as I trust in the Lord Jesus. Now that's the basic position, and I, I'm sure for most of us that's fairly familiar basic Christian fundamental teaching, isn't it? And that's really important. But what the Apostle Paul does uh, in this evening's passage, we're going to be looking mainly from verse 12 down to the end of the chapter, is he wants to show us how that basic position, which we could call justification by faith, being made righteous by faith in the Lord Jesus, that basic position is meant to shape us into a whole attitude, a whole stance, a whole way of thinking about the Christian life. It is, if you like, a whole pattern for Christian discipleship, a whole way of, of thinking about Christian maturity. So that's what we're going to be seeing tonight, I hope. Now, the way the uh, Apostle does this is uh, three sort of big steps. First of all, he clarifies his own position, verses uh, 30, 12 through to 16. And then secondly, he calls us to follow him. And that's in verses 17 down to verse 19. And then finally, he gives us some encouragement to take away with us in the last two verses. So we're going to look firstly then at what I'm calling a surprising stance that the Apostle takes about himself a surprising stance. Uh, have a look at verse 12. Paul says, Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Now, the, the language that Paul's using here is slightly tricky and sort of slightly vague, and our translators have um, tried to kind of pin it down for us. They've kind of, sort of tried to give us a little bit of help. And I, I think they've possibly tried to give us slightly too much help. If you look at an older translation, you'll find uh, it's a little bit more vague. Um, that, that idea of obtaining all this and having arrived at my goal, those things are kind of not in the original. And you'd see that if you compared it with um, a, another English translation. Um, but um, So what, what I think Paul is saying here is something slightly bigger than you might get at first sight. He's not just saying, I haven't got everything yet. He's not just saying, I haven't be arrived at my goal yet. He's actually kind of saying to us, I haven't obtained anything yet. I haven't really got there yet. I've not been made perfect yet. I'm not really mature yet. That's kind of what Paul's saying. And that, that, the word maturity, that, that's the word that's in this, in this verse. So Paul's you know, you might, you might kind of miss the detail of that, but the, the overall point, I think, is clear. Paul says, I don't want you to think that I've arrived. 
in any way as a Christian. And he, that's really meant to be surprising for us. We're meant to be like, what, Sam, have you got that right? Because then Paul repeats it again, verse 13, making it really clear, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenwards in Christ Jesus. Now again, the translators are helping us out and giving us a little bit more detail than I think is there in, in, in the original. But again, you can't miss the big point, can you? Paul is saying, I, I don't count myself as really having got there yet. I, I don't want you to think that I think, oh, I'm a great apostle and I really got things sorted. And in fact, he's so clear, isn't he? He says, one thing, one thing only I do. I forget everything that's behind me. And I simply focus on what's ahead, on that prize. Do you see how he's wanting us to be clear, isn't he? He doesn't think he's arrived as a Christian in any way, shape, or form. It's all in the past. It's nothing. One focus, one goal, one aim, the call that God makes on him in the, it, through Christ, heavenwards, his prize. That's his focus. Um, the picture here is obviously of a, of a runner in a race, isn't it? Uh, a runner who is trying to get to the finish line. And I, I have to say, I'm not a big runner at this point, so I'm happy to be picked apart by those who are um, late, later on. But I, I would suspect if I was to ever try and win, uh, race in a marathon, I, I would think it, I'd probably be wanting to count the miles and I'd be wanting to think about how much I'd done. But I also would not be wanting to allow myself to think, well, I've done 90% of a marathon, so I'm like 90% of a marathon winner. That's really good, isn't it? Because I'd just be wanting to stop. I think, oh, yes, you know, Sam, you've done 90% of a marathon. That's really good. I would not allow myself to think that. I would think to myself, I have got to do those final few um, crushingly hard miles. Because if I do not do them, I will not get the prize of completing this marathon. And that's what the Apostle's saying, isn't it? The, the image that comes to my mind is, you know how people kind of hand out drinks as you're kind of running uh, on a long race? It would be a bit like Paul sort of saying, you know, don't be one of those people that gets those drinks and kind of thinks that's, that's how you win the race. That's how you make it, by kind of accumulating lots of drinks. You want to be one of those runners that takes a drink, whoosh, chucks it straight away so that you can press on and win that race, because that and that alone is the prize. Paul's almost saying to us, he's saying, look, the language is he stretches out, doesn't he, to the goal. He's like one of those runners that's just desperate, desperate to get to the end of the race. And he's running, if you like, with empty hands, simply wanting to get to clutch that prize. So this is Paul's stance, and I think it's a surprising one, isn't it? As an apostle, Paul says he doesn't think of himself as having yet really achieved anything as a Christian. And we could even go a little bit stronger than that. I think Paul's really going all the way back to verse 8, which is why I asked Karen to kind of begin at verse 7. Paul says he considers everything rubbish. Why? So that he can gain Christ and be found in him. He says, verse 10, I want to know Christ. Um, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead. For Paul, it's like all these things, including gaining Christ. He hasn't got them yet. They're the prize that, he, that is held out for him at the end of his race. So Paul doesn't yet think of himself as having gained Christ. He says, I forget everything that's in my past. I'm simply straining towards that goal of gaining Christ. And you think, well, Paul, is this right? Surely the great apostle of grace can rejoice in the, the great salvation that he gets as a gift from Christ, can't he? Well, Paul says, brothers and sisters, verse 13, I don't consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. Now, I don't want you to mishear me at this point. In other contexts, Paul is quite capable of talking about some of the great things he's done as an apostle. He's quite capable of talking about um, his sort of his role in the church and how Christ has entrusted him with a particular task and how people need to listen to him. He's quite capable of, of rejoicing in the great salvation that Christ has won for us, that is ours by faith. But, he says, 
in terms of this, in terms of where my confidence as a Christian is, in terms of where my kind of my, 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 my expectation is for being perfect or growing as a Christian or having anything really fundamental and solid as a Christian, in all those contexts, Paul says, I don't consider myself yet to have attained all this. Do you see the language there? He, I don't consider myself. You could say, I don't reckon myself. I don't count myself. I don't think of myself, he says, as somebody who's achieved anything in the Christian life. I don't consider myself to have gained Christ. He's waiting for me there at the end of my race. And so I focus on running this race with arms outstretched towards him. Um, And this is a stance that's not just for Paul, the great apostle. This is a stance that he wants us all to share. So still in this first point, Paul carries on, verse 15. All of us then, he says, who are mature, should take such a view of things. You need to share his stance, he says. And if on some point you think differently, well, that too, God will make it clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Now, I have to say, I don't fully understand um, the second half of what I've just read. But again, the first sentence, I think, is pretty clear, isn't it? All of us who are mature should take such a view of things. In other words, Paul's saying to these Philippians, if you want to be mature, if you want to grow as a Christian, This is what maturity as a Christian looks like. It looks like recognizing that you're not mature. Your maturity is precisely in recognizing you haven't gained anything yet. That you're simply running the race, arms outstretched, looking towards Christ. That is maturity in the Christian life, to recognize that and to see that that's really good. Well, how might this change our stance then, if Paul wants us to kind of reflect his? Well, We talk quite a lot, don't we, and I think rightly so, about being saved um, at the sort of the very moment of our conversion. And that's really good. It's right, I think, to talk about that. You know, we say, you know, when you ask Jesus into your heart, that's it, you're born again, you're saved, your life has changed, you're justified by faith. That is all really good, and that's right to say, if we've got a real understanding of the gospel, we will want to say that. But sometimes we can say that and only say that and we can kind of leave the impression that what we do then is we get saved and then there's really nothing left for us to do except wait around until heaven. We kind of sit in our pew, go to church and that's it because we're saved. That's already happened. It's all in the past. And human nature being what it is, we're all going to want to strive for something. We're all going to want to achieve something. And so if we can't achieve anything in terms of uh, running a Christian race, then we're going to kind of achieve in other areas. We're going to maybe try to look really impressive in in the way that we dress. We're maybe going to try and um, have a really impressive job and not really link that to being a Christian. Um, Maybe we would try and run a really impressive organisation in church and we're going to try and achieve and we're going to find ourselves slipping back into kind of works mode because we haven't understood Uh, The gospel is actually something that we still need to kind of chase after. Paul says that he presses on. Literally, he pursues the prize, the upward call of God in Christ. Um, I think that's interesting, that language. Actually, Paul used it earlier on in the chapter. Um, Verse 6, Paul said that as for zeal persecuting or pursuing the church. So do you remember what Paul was like before he became a Christian? A Pharisee? He was pursuing the church. He was pursuing Christians. And then he heard a call from heaven. The Lord Jesus spoke to him and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And the Lord forgave him, turned his life around and commissioned him to go and be the apostle to the nations. And I think it's very interesting that as a Christian and not a Pharisee anymore, Paul hasn't stopped running. He hasn't stopped pursuing. The only difference is, instead of of pursuing Christians, he's now pursuing Christ. That's the difference. He's running after Christ, and he's not willing to think that he's arrived. 
Now that is not to say that we can't be confident in our salvation. It's not to say that our salvation doesn't come by faith and it's now by works or anything like that. The point is more to say our salvation comes by faith and we can be confident that the God who began a good work in us will carry on to the day of completion. That's what Paul says in Philippians 1. But we're to think of ourselves, this is the safe and good and godly way to think of ourselves, as not really having that salvation yet as, if you like, being in the race and holding on to faith in Christ and making sure that we just get to the end of the finish line, trusting in the Lord Jesus. That's how we are to think of ourselves if we're mature. And that changes, doesn't it, how we think about Christian maturity then, Christian discipleship. Being a mature Christian isn't about building up religious credit. It's not sort of about having your slate wiped clean when you become a Christian. You sort of forget about your old life, and now you sort of start again, building up new kind of Christian credit to replace all that rubbish credit that you had in your old life. It's not about that. Paul says that maturity is actually about having a more and more single-minded focus on Christ. Verse 10, he says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation, fellowship in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Do you see that somehow there? That's how he's thinking. He's not so saying, I'm not sure if I'm going to be saved or not, but he's kind of thinking, I need to keep running this race so that I'll be found trusting in the Lord Jesus, found in Christ when he comes, and get to share in his victory. Uh, John Calvin says our whole life on Paul's kind of model should be compared to nothing else but a picture of death. Very strong, isn't it? But that's what Paul's saying. I want to share in Christ's sufferings, becoming like him in his death. But that's the key, isn't it? Becoming like the Lord Jesus in his death. And the Lord Jesus' death was not passive, was it? It wasn't that he lay back and just died. No, he gave up his spirit. He poured out his life to death. He loved us to the end. And that's what Paul's calling us to do. To love, love, love. Trust, trust, trust. Becoming like the Lord Jesus in his death all the way to the end. Well, that's Paul's stance. Uh, And then he very practically applies this, verse 17, and the application is very obvious now, and I've kind of already made it, but Paul makes it more explicit now. Verse 17, he makes a controversial call. He says, join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. So there's the call. Join me, follow my example. I don't consider uh, myself to have gained anything. Rather, I forget what's past. I keep my eyes on the prize. Join me, Paul says, in doing that. And he says, be alert. Be watchful. Look at those people who live as we do. Because Paul knows this is actually a controversial call. Have a look. Verse 18, he says, For as I have often told you before, And now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. Well, these are very sobering words, aren't they? Very serious words. And clearly, Paul's talking most immediately about the people that he's been warning us about since verse 2 of this chapter. He's talking about the dogs, the evildoers, the mutilators of the flesh. These people are encouraging us to put our confidence, Paul says, in the flesh, verse 3. People are encouraging these Christians in Philippi to be circumcised, to keep the Jewish laws in order to be more perfect. And Paul says, well, listen, Philippians, These people are enemies of the cross of Christ. They don't think that Jesus' death is enough to save you. They think you need to add to that if you want to be perfect, if you want to be fully mature. They don't think it's enough for you to live your life looking towards the prize of Jesus Christ coming when when he returns. They want you to boast 
in human achievements and ceremonies. But really, they, they're, God, they're showing that their God is just their belly. Their mind is on earthly things. They're glorying in things that are shameful. And so their end, if they continue this way, can only be destruction. So Paul is most obviously talking here about these, these Jewish Christians, these teachers who are kind of saying, have Christ, have circumcision as well to be perfect. But the way that Paul talks suggests, doesn't it, I think, that he expects this to not just be a one-off issue in his time or with just this particular thing. You see how he says, uh, I've often told you before and now tell you again that many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. And the language that he uses is very general at this point. And I think Paul is saying that he expects this to be an issue in churches time and time again. It's as though he's saying there will always be people who live as enemies of the cross of Christ. There will always be those people who are modelling for us a different path of discipleship, a different path of maturity, a way of getting more perfect as a Christian that is not following the path laid out for us by the Lord Jesus in his death. So it's as though we've got two different paths, Paul's saying, of people around us who are offering us models of how to live the Christian life. And Paul's saying, keep an eye on me and those who live the way I do, and watch out for people who are offering you this other path, this path of accumulating credit, of making yourself more perfect, of human attainment and achievement in whatever sphere it is, however godly it might appear to be. Paul says, watch out for those people. You want to live the way I do, forgetting everything human, only looking towards the end goal. So this is a controversial call, I would suggest, because there will always be people in Christian circles and in our churches who are sort of discipling us the wrong way, into a deadly way. So Paul says, follow my pattern and those like me who forget all that's past and keep your eyes on the prize. Let me make applications to, to three, people, three groups of people here uh, quickly. Firstly, to, to anyone here tonight who's perhaps not a Christian or perhaps feels like you're not really sure where you sit in relation to Christ, what I want to say to you tonight is don't be intimidated. It can be intimidating, can't it, to, look, to come into church circles and look around you and you kind of think, wow, everyone seems to really have it together here. People are quite smart. They, 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 they're in marriages mostly. They, they look like they've got lives that work. They've often got jobs and children and grandchildren. Everything looks good around me here. And if you're not a Christian, um, that can look very intimidating because you kind of think, well, if I'm going to be a Christian, do I have to be like that? Do I have to really buck up? Uh, and uh, I don't think I could do that. I mean, I've heard people who, who've come into churches like this one who've looked around and said, this Christianity thing is not for me because everyone looks too smart, too professional, too well-kept. And so if that's you this, this evening, I want to say to you, don't be intimidated because uh, we're not like that. We, we might, some of us, look more impressive than others. Graham's certainly looking good for his age. <laughs> uh, but, but really... I'm speaking for myself here, we're not impressive. And if there's one thing we can do, the thing we'll do is we'll stay in the race. God help us. We'll stay in the race. And that's what the Apostle Paul wants to do, isn't it? He wants to take the scales from our eyes and say, look, I'm not all that amazing. I don't think of myself as perfect or having it reached very much. I just want to stay in the race. So my encouragement to you, if you're somebody who's not sure where you stand this evening, is just get in the race. Just get in that race of trusting in the Lord Jesus and looking forward to his coming. Just stretch out your hands to him um, and, and run the race with us. Well, what about if you're somebody who's a newer Christian? Perhaps you're a younger person uh, or you're somebody who's recently uh, come to faith or grown in your faith and you're kind of thinking to yourself, well, what does the path look like for me now? Where, where, where do I go? How do I grow as a Christian? And that's a great question to ask because we can and we should be seeking to grow and mature as Christians. But what I want to say to you, if you're a younger Christian here tonight, is don't be deceived. Just be aware that there are different pathways that people will offer under the guise of Christianity, and they won't be the same. You might read a book, and it looks very Christian, and it's all about discipling you and growing you in your faith, and actually, it's, it's actually teaching you to put your confidence in the flesh, in your human attainments. 
Look out for people who are going to disciple you and teach you to follow the way Paul does, his pattern, that where you forget, if you like, all your human attainments when it comes to knowing Christ. And finally, let, let me say a word to those who would consider themselves mature, more mature Christians, perhaps a little bit further along in that race. You, you're a few years, a few decades ahead of us. You know more of what it's like to be a sinner. You know more what it's like to have to keep trusting and looking to Christ every day. Can I encourage you to, to make sure that you don't model anything other than what Paul is modeling for us here? He's a great model, isn't he, Paul, in this? Because he's so open and honest about what's driving him. He doesn't want anybody to go away with the false impression that he's a great apostle, he's achieved all this in the church, and that's really great. He is very explicit, and we should be very explicit, I think, with those that we have the opportunity to, to model the Christian life to, that we really haven't attained anything when it, when it re- in terms of what really counts. We can do great things, we can certainly seek to serve the Lord, but the, the, the bottom, rock bottom thing, the thing that we have confidence in, is simply being in the race of faith, looking to Jesus. Well, this is all tough stuff, isn't it? Because it isn't easy, is it, to, to stay in that race of faith. It isn't easy, actually, to forget all that lies behind us. It's always tempting to, to feel like you can bank something, have something in your spiritual credit bank. And so finally, the uh, apostle wants to encourage us. Um, He wants to encourage us with a heavenly hope, verses 20 to 21. So he says, the enemies of the cross, they have their mind on earthly things. But, he says, verse 20, our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. So the first thing Paul says in these verses is he shows us what we have. He says we have a citizenship in heaven. Now, Philippi was a Roman colony. And what that meant was that the city of Philippi was a kind of like an outpost of the Roman Empire that actually sought to replicate as much as possible the the laws and the rules of Rome. It was, if you like, a kind of a mini Rome. And and so Philippians who had their citizenship in Philippi were actually really had their citizenship in Rome as they lived according to the rules and righteousness uh, and lifestyle of Rome. And the Apostle Paul says, well, brothers and sisters, we are on earth. We die every day. Life is difficult for us. We have lowly bodies, but don't focus on those because we've got a citizenship that's in heaven. We, if you like, are colony members of a higher and more perfect kingdom. We have a righteousness for us there in heaven that we can hold on to and trust in completely. And why is that so precious? Well, because our own dear Saviour will come from heaven and he will come with victory in his hands. The Lord Jesus is, um, the Paul, Paul says in, this, in these verses that the Lord Jesus is like a second Adam. Do you remember the first Adam was called to subdue the earth, wasn't it? To be a king who would rule over the earth rightly and well. But what did Adam do? He listened to the voice of a serpent, he fell into temptation, and he lost the chance to subdue the earth and rule it in the way that he was intended. But the Lord Jesus is the second Adam. He's the one who said no to earthly glory. Do you remember how Satan tempted him with all those earthly glories? And the Lord Jesus said no to that. And he said yes to the way of the cross, yes to dying, Yes to pouring out his life and giving it in love for his people. And that makes him victorious. And now he sits at God's right hand with all power. And the power to subdue and rule the earth adds God's anointed king. And so one day he will come and he will transform this earth and make it perfect and glorious. 
And there's a great promise for those of us who are worrying about um, the climate change crisis. He will subdue this world and make it glorious as the true second Adam. And as he does that, he will transform our lowly bodies and make them like his glorious spiritual heavenly body that he gained at his resurrection. And then he will call us up to be with him. That's our heavenly hope. And I think that really encourages us. It encourages me, and I hope it encourages you. Because we do have earthly bodies, don't we? And we want, I think, a lot of the time to try and dress ourselves up, to sort of paint ourselves up and make ourselves look a little bit better. It's tempting, isn't it, to boast in what we can, to give ourselves a little bit of a shine. But that, if you like, is to anticipate to try and bring forwards too quickly what the Lord Jesus is going to do for us when he comes. He is going to glorify us. He's going to make us beautiful. And we live in hope for that day. We don't want to look, put lipstick on a pig. We don't want to dress ourselves up. We don't want to put confidence in the flesh. Because the Lord Jesus is going to make us his glorious bride. And we're not going to settle for anything less than that. Our hope is so big, so great, so wonderful, because our Saviour is so wonderful, that what we're going to do is keep waiting for him, straining, stretching, pursuing him, and not putting any confidence in the flesh. Isn't that right? We're going to try and say to ourselves every day, every moment of our lives, to him be the glory, to him be the glory, together with the Father, and the Son, forever and ever. Amen. Can I lead us in a brief prayer? Father, we thank you that we do have such a wonderful Saviour, a true second Adam, a man who succeeded where the first Adam and all of us would have failed, a man who poured his life out to death and who will come and make us like himself one day. So, Father, please keep us straining towards him. Please keep us looking towards him. And help us, we pray, to put no confidence in our flesh. Make us mature, make us grow as Christians, and show us, please, what the Apostle learned all those years ago, that to live is Christ, to die is gain, to count everything a loss compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus our Lord. And in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening to Bloomfield Presbyterian Church Sermon Audio. We're a congregation in East Belfast with worship services at 11am and 7pm every Sunday. For more information, visit bloomfieldpresbyterian.org.